Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. My name is Dana. I'm a member of the education team here at the Aquarium. And today, you and I get to go on an adventure together, learning all about how fun fish can be. We're going to explore different shapes, different colors, different habitats that they might live in. So if that sounds like something you want to join me with, go ahead, come on, get up close to the camera, get up close to the TV, the computer, wherever you are watching, and get ready to explore. Now, right down here, you'll see that we have ways for you to communicate with us. We have a text phone number, texting only. Please do not call. Uh, the phone number is 562-286-1838. Now, if you're watching this program after the live stream, which is at 9 a.m. on Wednesday, September 15th, you'll see that we do have an email address, okay? And that's live at lbaop.org. So, Text us during our live feed, email us afterwards. We'd love to hear your questions, your comments, anything that you're wondering or th something you want to discover a little bit more about. Go ahead, let us know. Now we're going to start by defining a fish. We're actually going to draw what we think a fish is. Now if you want to participate, you can always grab some paper and a pencil, but there's no need. You can always just watch and comment on my artwork. We're going to get set up here. Give me one moment, I'm setting up a whiteboard. All right, let's jump over, see what this looks like. Hmm, it's a little washed out. How about now? Oh, that looks much better. All right, my friends, so a fish. What makes a fish a fish? I wanna think about that for a second. Oftentimes when we think of a fish, we're thinking of an animal that has a fairly football-shaped body, right? Now, this is because this shape right here is really, really good for moving through water. Water comes towards it, and it goes up and over the body, and it makes it very easy to move through. So a lot of fish are shaped like this, but not every fish are shaped like this. In fact, we're going to explore a handful of fish today that have a very different body shape. Now, fish have fins. Right? Now, if you're watching this and you want to think about what a fish has, feel free to text in. Let us know what I should add to my drawing. Now, fish have a handful of different fins. We're going to start back here at what we call whoops, the caudal fin or the tail fin. Ah, somebody texted in tail fin. Perfect. Thank you for joining us today. So tail fin, also known as the caudal fin. A lot of fish will use this to propel them forward through the water right? Moving them forward. Now fish also have a big fin up top. It's called the dorsal fin. We're going to add a dorsal fin right there. Fish have, how do fish move? If they're not using their caudal fin, they're using their pectoral fins. And those are the two fins right here on the side of their body. So let's go ahead and add those. So there is a pectoral fin. Ah, now somebody said eyes. Eyes, of course.
So my microphone batteries needed to be changed. So what I was asking was, do the fish eyes go back here? No, that doesn't seem right. Our fish eyes are looking forward, seeing what's going on in front of the fish. So I'm going to draw a little fish eye right here, put a little sparkle in its eye. Now, we are going to discuss some fish that have big spots back here. And we actually will call those a false eye. We'll talk about those a little bit later on. All right, my friends. So we've got our fins. We have a couple more coming down here. We have it, two fins that actually come off the bottom of a fish's body right here. All right. So our fish fins are looking pretty good. We've got the eyeball. What else is up front here? I'm going to draw a fish with a frowny face. Fish often have big mouths like that that open up a lot. So I'm going to draw it upside down so this whole mouth would whoop, open up there. Now what else do fish have? How do fish breathe? How do fish breathe? Do they have lungs like you and I? <sighs> no, they don't have lungs. Fish have gills. They have gill slits on the side of them. Uh, sharks have slits. Other fish have a cover, just one slit. We call that the operculum. So let's draw our gill slit right here. Ah, someone said scales. Yeah. Fish have a nice protected body covered by scales. So we're going to draw. We're not going to draw scales all over the fish or we'd be here all day, but we can draw a lot of them, right? So fish have scales. Nice job. Now, when you take a look at this drawing here, do you agree that this is a pretty average fish, right? Are we missing anything? Hmm. Gills, fins, scales. Seems pretty fishy to me, right? All right. Now, today we're going to be exploring fish, but they're not all going to look like this. Remember, this is a very stereotypical fish. When you close your eyes and picture a fish, we're, we're often picturing something like this. But today we're going to explore a handful of different fish. However, they're all going to have gills. They're all going to have fins. And not all of them have scales. But we'll keep an eye out for the ones that do. All right, my friends, let's go ahead and explore one of our first fish. And this is actually going to be one of those fish that has a false eye spot like we talked about. Let's go ahead and explore our butterfly fish. Our butterfly fish. Look how cute that is. Now, that looks a little bit different than what I just drew. And yet, if we take a look, we'll see that it does actually have those same characteristics. Here's its tail fin that you mentioned. Here's the two fins coming down on the bottom. This is actually its pectoral fin right here. It's kind of hard to see, but you can look right here and see the rays coming out. It's got a clear pectoral fin. It's got that dorsal fin on top. If you look, you can actually see scales. Check that out. Do you see all of these individual little scales right in here? It's got an eyeball, like you all mentioned. It's got the gill cover right here. That's called the operculum. And this fish has a little bit of a different mouth, right? It doesn't have that football frown. But instead, it's got a nice, cute little mouth coming straight out the front. Now, do you think a fish like this is eating really big stuff? Is it opening its mouth like, ah? No. This fish uses its little mouth to get into cracks and crevices and feed on algae. This fish actually likes to eat algae. So it's like a vegetarian. Now, someone chimed in and said, this is such a fun class. I'm so glad you're enjoying yourselves. If you have any questions, go ahead and let us know, okay? Now, this is what I want to talk about. This is what I said is called a false eye spot. Why does this fish have a fake eye? What do you think that does? Hmm. Now, it can't see out of this eye. This is just a dot on its body. But the real eye is up front here. Now, a lot of fish that have a false eye spot like this, it's a type of camouflage. It actually helps hide them from their predators or helps them escape their predators. Now, if I was a predator and I'm coming and I'm hunting, right, and I'm swimming and I'm looking and I see this, I might attack this side of the fish thinking that I was going for the eye, thinking I was going for the head. And yet I'd really be coming from behind. So this fish would be able to... Zoom away really, really fast in the proper direction. 
Now, another thing that the false eye spots do, you'll notice that this spot is actually bigger than the eyeball itself. And so eye spots like this can make predators think that this animal is bigger than it really is. So we might scroll through some other animals here looking for some eye spots as the program goes on. If you see one, let us know, okay? Yeah. Ah, somebody asked, that's a great question. When fish have polka dots, are they all false eye spots? Great question. Do we have the giant sea bass photo we can throw on the screen? All right, so this fish, this is a giant sea bass. This is actually the frowny face that I was drawing earlier. Um, you'll notice that this fish is covered in black polka dots. Those are not false eye spots. So a false eye spot is usually going to be like one big one somewhere on the body, right? That really highlights that it might look like an eye. Polka dots, ooh, here's a really good one. Like there is a very clear uh, false eye spot. That was a perfect uh, example. Thank you, Jen. All right, my friends. So uh, you might have just heard me reference my friend Jen back there. I am not alone in the studio today. I always like to remind people that we work as a team here at the aquarium. I have Jen behind the computer controlling all the magic you see here. And I have Cynthia who's taking your questions and all of your texts and then passing them into me. So uh, we are so happy that you're joining our team and discovering a little bit more about our false eye spots. Now, this fish that we're looking at right here, does anyone know what kind of fish this is? Hmm. It's not a butterfly fish like we were just looking at. This it might, it might surprise you because it's different than what we expect when we look into like a friend's fish tank. This is actually a type of angelfish. This is a king angelfish. So very brightly colored, often found in tropical waters. All right, my friends. So so far, we've looked at a couple false eye spots. Now we're going to go a totally different direction, okay? We're going to check out one of my favorite fish, and I'm going to show you how to make this fish first. Everybody put your hands, thumbs up like this. Flat hand, thumb up. Now take your other hand, here we go, take your other hand, and turn it upside down, okay? So you have one hand up and one hand upside down, and now put them together like that. And you have a mola mola. Let's see what a mola mola looks like. Oh my gosh, look, they're best friends. Let me see if I can do this. Let's see. Hi. Hi there. All right, so a mola mola. Now, my friends, does this look like any other fish you've seen before? This fish, I disappeared for a second. <laughs> So this fish, this fish is a little bit different it's body shape, but also size. That butterfly fish we just looked at, maybe the size of your hand. Okay, this one, little one, little fish. The mola mola, everybody reach your hand way up to the ceiling. Reach your other hand way down to the ground. And you might be about the size of a mola mola. They can get 13 feet from the top to the bottom here. So they're really, really big. In fact, my friends, this is the largest bony fish in the world. Now that's important to note because there's bony fish, like that one right there, or the butterfly fish, or a clownfish, or a pufferfish, or a Garibaldi, or the giant sea bass. Those are all examples of bony fish. But we also have cartilaginous fish. They don't have bones in their bodies like them, or like you and I. Their whole skeleton is made out of cartilage, like we have in our ears. And sharks fall under the cartilaginous fish. So today we're focusing mostly on bony fish, but you'll hear me say bony fish, and I want to give you reference. So again, the mola mola is the largest bony fish in the world, 13 feet, okay? Now let's take a look at this fish as we zoom in a little bit. Does it have fins? Well, yes, there's a caudal fin. There's its dorsal fin. Here's those fins that come off the bottom. Only really one. There might be a little one up here. And that is its pectoral fin. Now, does it have gills? Yes, it does. It doesn't quite have the gill cover that we're used to seeing, the little line that runs right here. But you can kind of see it right in here. The water is going to go in its mouth, pass over its gills, and then out. Does it have an eyeball? Yes, it does. And it's got a cute little mouth right in the front here. So molas, oh, 
do this really cool thing. They're a pelagic fish, meaning they're out in the open ocean and they can swim all around, right? They're nice and gray on their body. As you saw there, they could camouflage just with the color of the ocean itself. Now on this picture, what we're looking at right here is we're actually seeing a mola mola right on the surface of the ocean. And if you ever go on a whale watch boat or if you come across a mola mola out in the water, this is most likely how you're going to see them. And that's because mola molas like to come up to the surface of the water and they like to lay there and just lay there and lay there and lay there. And what they're doing is they're actually, they're coming up to the surface, they're sunning themselves. But a really special thing that happens is seagulls and other seabirds will come to the mola and they will pick all the little parasites off of the mola mola. And so it's a relationship between seabirds and a fish. The fish gets a cleaning and the food, the fish, uh, birds get food. <laughs> so it's really amazing to see this super ocean animal come up to the surface and have a relationship with a bird in the sky. So mola molas, the largest bony fish in the ocean. One more time, let's practice. You can take one hand, thumb up, one hand, thumb down, put them together. It's kind of like awkward turtle, but you're going to the side. <gasps> ah, somebody is asking, uh, they said that molas are their favorite fish. Me too. And they're asking if scientists ever studied them. Well, yeah, scientists do a lot when it comes to studying sea animals. All of the facts I've told you have come from observations and scientists learning about this stuff in the sea. So I don't know any current research that is going on with mola molas. Does anyone ever, does anyone want to look some up for me? Um, I don't know if there is any, but we're constantly learning. So if you're out on the ocean and you come across a mola, you can learn right then and there. Cynthia and Janet looks like you're going to look up maybe some research right now. Here's another photo of a mola mola up on the surface. You can see its little fin likes to stick out. Oftentimes these animals get confused for large sharks. Large sharks. You can see with their little fin sticking out right there. Let's see, Cynthia's scrolling. Ah, okay. So Cynthia said that she knows they were studying a little bit more about molas and their relationship with the deep sea because we know a lot about molas and their surface relationship, right? But we don't know much about what goes on while they're diving. So deep sea molas. Now, speaking of deep sea at 10 o'clock after this program, Cynthia is actually going to be teaching a science of the deep sea class in Spanish. So I do encourage you to come hang out and learn a little bit about both the Spanish language as well as our deep sea environment. All right, so we've talked a lot about our molas. Oh my gosh, that is like my dream right here. Check it out. So this is a big camera. This is someone snorkeling with a mola. Now molas, for how big they are and how, you know, they don't look like there's a lot going on, they can be really fast swimmers when they want to be. They can cruise through the water. So it is actually really hard to get an experience like this. All right, my friends, so let's go ahead and jump to another fish. We're going to move on to a much smaller fish, but also a much more colorful fish. We're going to explore the painted greenling. Okay, the painted greenling. Now I'm going to give Jen a minute to get this fish up on the screen. We might have to, oh, look at that. So fast. So this fish right here, this is a little bit different. This fish looks a lot like the fish that I drew, but you'll notice that it's on the bottom a little bit more. Of course, in this photo, it's just on a white background, but these pectoral fins right here, are used a little bit more for kind of standing on the bottom. But once again, let's make sure that it is a fish. Does it have fins? Yes, we've got the dorsal fins up top. We've got the tail or caudal fin back here. We've got the one, the two fins on the bottom. And then of course, there are pectoral fins that come way out here. Does this fish have gills? Yes, it does. It's hard to see, but there is a gill cover right in here. That's where the gills are hiding. The water goes in the mouth, out over the gills. Now, does this fish have scales? That's something the mola mola was lacking. And if you look real close, you can see there's actually a lot of scales around here. Right? Check out, like right in here, you can really see those individual scales. 
Wow, that's amazing. Now, I love this photo, but let's go ahead and see what happens when we put this fish into its natural habitat. Wait, 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 where is it? Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit. So right now we're in a kelp forest and that's where you're gonna find painted greenlings. They like to hang out in algae and then they're gonna be, look at that camouflage. So this is a painted greenling right in here. That's the same fish we were just looking at. But now we don't have that white background anymore. Instead, we have a photo of this fish in its natural habitat. So you can see that there's a lot going on here, but that fish, all the colors and patterns that we observed matches the background. So it camouflages inside of its space. Now, if you look here, those long pectoral fins we were talking about, they're kind of leaning on them, right? So painted greenlings are a type of Sculpin, right? Sculpin is a different kind of body shape. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of sculpins out there, but painted greenlings are much more similar to the sculpin body shape. All right, my friends, very cool. Now, I mentioned how these fish live in kelp forests and rocky reefs. Kelp forests and rocky reefs. If you are viewing uh, from California, if you're, you're watching from California, like where we are, Kelp forests and rocky reefs are a very, very common habitat that we have off of our coastline. So you can see here that we've got all sorts of algae growing. This is giant kelp over here. We got a lot of rock work in the background. So there's a whole bunch going on here. This is a kelp forest habitat. Now, I know there's a little bit of a delay between my live feed and the view on your uh, YouTube. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to take one moment here. I'm going to pause, let the feed catch up, and see if we have any questions coming in so far about the butterfly fish, the mola, or the painted greenling before we move on to our last fish. Let's go ahead and just enjoy the view of the uh, kelp forest for now. Give a minute or two for any questions to come in. Oh my gosh. So we had a question come in. I knew there were some. We had a question come in and that question was, how long do mola mola live? How long do our ocean sunfish live? And the answer really surprised all of us here in the studio. Mola molas only live to be about seven to nine years. Under human care, they've lived up to 10. Typically under human care, animals will live longer just because they're getting the perfect diet and um, you know, they kind of have a doctor on site, but only seven to nine years. That is shocking to me. Wow. Now here's what's crazy about that. Mola molas, they can, they also lay, they're the largest, but they also lay the most eggs. I want to say it's like 3 million eggs or something. 300 million eggs. Holy cow. 300 million eggs for a mola mola. Now, most of those eggs don't actually survive to adulthood. They're all little tiny plankton and a lot of them get eaten. But that's kind of the point, right? You lay a bunch hoping that some of them become adults. Wow, that's awesome. Any other questions coming in out there? Um, oh, Winston wants to know. Have I ever seen a mola? I think we have some big mola fans here. Um, I have seen a mola. I've never seen one underwater though. So remember when we had them on the surface and I said that's most likely where you're gonna see them? I have seen them on the surface. I've never seen one underwater. However, I have friends who saw some in Monterey Bay. And I also have a friend who saw a different species, very similar, another sunfish, another mola, um, off, I believe they were out in, off the coast of South Carolina. And it's just so cool to see molas underwater because they do move pretty slow. Okay. And then all of a sudden they just take off. So they're very, very cool fish. Winston's asking, do fish migrate? 
Oh, Winston wants to know, do fish migrate? Do fish migrate? Well, that's really interesting, Winston, because a lot of fish live in very certain areas. So remember that butterfly fish from earlier? That is a tropical coral reef fish. You're typically only going to see them in coral reefs, and a lot of fish will have a very small range. The species might, might live a bunch of places, but individual fish might only live in, you know, a 10-foot radius, 10 feet, right? However, sharks are fish, and sharks are known to migrate, especially great white sharks. They have been known to come in towards the coast during certain parts of the year and out to the uh, White Shark Cafe. That is what we've named this site in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and we still don't know a whole lot about it. Um, but there is documentation of white sharks migrating to the coast and back to the center and to the coast. So yes, some fish migrate, some fish hang out in one little space for their entire life. Now, my friends, we're going to end on one last fish here. We're going to explore a puffer fish, a puffer fish. Oh, look at that. Now, puffer fish are a little bit different as well. Remember, we started out with a very basic body shape today. And then what we've done is we have explored other kinds of bodies and other characteristics of fish. But let's start with the basics. Does a puffer fish have fins? Yes, it does. It has very cute fins. That's a fin right over there. You can see the rays kind of coming out. We've got another fin right up here. We've got another fin coming down here. We can actually see the other pectoral fin, I think, over on the other side. So yes, puffers do in fact have fins. Or yeah. Do they have gills? Do puffers have gills? Yes, they do. So they are a fish. They are breathing underwater. The water goes in their mouth and out over their gills. So yes, they do. It's just hard to see. I believe they have an operculum somewhere in here. Aha! Oh, look at it! Happy. He doesn't look as happy today as you know. Look at that. that! So this is one. That was one of our puffers that we have here at the aquarium. Um, and as you can see, those fins were really working hard. You could see the water kind of coming out across the gills. Now, as far as scales, remember we said scales were kind of a protective cover over the body of our fish. Puffers go above and beyond that, right? Take a look at this. You can actually, oh, this is a great photo. You can actually see all of the spikes on this animal because puffer fish have this great adaptation. Now, I believe that's the first time I've said that word today. What is an adaptation? Hmm. An adaptation is something that an animal has on or in its body that helps it survive. Okay. So gills would be a great adaptation. It helps them survive underwater. Lungs are an adaptation that you and I have. It helps us survive in our habitat on land, right? But an adaptation can also be something that helps defend this animal, such as all of the spikes that cover this puffer fish. Now, when puffers get stressed out, when they think they're getting eaten, when they're trying to defend themselves, they'll actually expand their body. And all these spines poke out and they become much more uh, difficult for a predator to attack. What a great way to have all the characteristics of a fish, but just a little bit more, right? They've got that spiky body that covers them. Now, one thing that I like to do, one thing that I like to do uh, in my classes in particular, is I like to compare things. So we're going to take a little bit of a turn. We're going to look at a non-fish. Okay, we're going to look at an animal called an invertebrate that has a very similar adaptation. Again, it's a type of protection, and just like the puffer, it's very spiny. So let's go ahead and take a look at our purple sea urchin. Now, the purple sea urchin right here, they are not a fish. They do not have fins. Okay. They do not, uh, they do not have gills. All right. Most importantly though, they don't have bones. So that's what makes them an invertebrate. But what I wanted to highlight is that we can make connections. Adaptations are a great way to compare and contrast animals. Okay. So even though this animal is very, very, very different than a puffer fish, they do defend themselves in a very similar way. They have that spiky body that makes it much more difficult. So my friends, my challenge for you, we're going to be wrapping up the class here in a moment. My challenge for you is to start looking at things, two objects, two animals, 
and try to figure out how those animals survive. And now it can help if you look at one animal versus another animal. So maybe we can practice with your dog and your cat. Hmm. Well, we feed them and we pet them and we give them a lot of love so they can survive pretty easily. But imagine if you weren't in the picture. Well, both the dogs and cats have long legs to help them move around and escape, right? Oh, look at this little puffer. Hi. What else? Oh, both of your dogs and cats have lungs to breathe air. They both have ears to make sure that they're paying attention to their surroundings. They both have teeth, right, to help eat their food and also defend themselves. So looking at two animals that are very similar can really help you start to notice those adaptations. Now, my friends, we're going to be wrapping it up here, but I do have one last question from Winston who wants to know, do puffers puff themselves up with water? And Winston, you might have stumped me. Is it with water or with air? <laughs> All right, Winston, I asked my friends in the studio and one said water and one said air. So we're going to get that answer for you in just one moment. We're looking. Both. If they're underwater, if they're underwater, they obviously will use water. And if they're scared while out of the air, so like maybe if one was caught, uh, then they would they would use air. So it's both. All right, my friends. Well, thank you so much for learning and discovering with us today. I know I just discovered a little bit more about pufferfish. That's great. We love when you ask questions that can stump us. It helps us learn as well. We know a lot, but we don't know everything. So thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you back here at 10 o'clock for our Spanish program about the deep sea. Otherwise, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday, and we'll see you next time on the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. Bye-bye.